I want to see how many of you thought about the difference between spending time and investing time during after we had that. How many of you kind of had a shift in your thought about time? I, did, I mean, I know I did, so I'm kind of interested in hearing about what happens to you in the uh, that consciousness shift of whether we're spending and consuming all the time we have here or whether we're investing in the time. So we are doing what? We are we are living in time. And we are living in a specific period of time. But how do we measure time? Some, there's a clock right here in the back of the room. It's going tick, tick, tick with the second hand just moving. Tick, tick, tick. It's mm -hmm. saying what time it is. But that clock is simply a representation. Here's our sun. And here, out here is the earth. And how many of you know the earth is orbiting the sun mm -hmm. and it's marking the seasons and also the earth, which way is the earth turning right now? Does it turn counterclockwise or clockwise? <laughs> I mean, it has reversed, it has reversed uh, time, but the earth is also turning. Yeah. Okay, so when we talk about the sun came up, the sun didn't really come up. The sun, in, regard, in relationship to the earth, is in a fixed orbit in relationship to the earth. So before I jump ahead, I want to give you time to kind of grasp what I'm saying because I'm going to go some weird places today. And everybody said, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to give you time to grasp this. So here is our our sun. I'll put an S there, and I'll put an E here. And, of course, you know there are other planets out there, but we're not going to talk about them because we don't want to talk about Jupiter time or Saturn time or Venus time or Mercury that's the closest. We don't want to talk about that time. We want to talk about our time. So as the Earth turns around its axis, then what happens? One side of the earth comes into view of the sun, and then when night comes, somebody else on the earth is seeing the sun, right? right. So our time here on earth is relative to something else, and that relativity is the sun. But when we talk about God's time, how, how, where is God's time in all this? Well, God exists outside of time. Outside of time. It says, in time shall be no more. God is not what what would God relate to? What would God's time be relative to? Hmm? You see what I'm saying? Our earth time is relative to the sun, but here's another further, further out thing, and that is that I, after we go outside of this, we have outside of this, and this is real small because this is huge. This is the solar system. Yes. So let's say you were on a planet on the outside of the solar system. What would your time be relative to? Being a star. Uh, Mercury has a much closer orbit there, so that it, it, their years go faster because here we're, we're marking the time around in a year, right? And we it could mark uh, months and seasons and the vernal equinox and the summer equinox and the uh, you've heard all that right so these are points in space around our sun and it also has to do with how it, the earth tilts so everything's relative is what i'm saying and this is a very short and not completely 
inclusive thing. I'm just trying to give you an idea so you think about what our time is in relation to. Well, God tells us that there's a 6,000-year period here on earth that's a specific time. This is real little. <laughs> specific time, and it's divided into six sections. And these are not exact. I need a wider board. Okay? So when we get to this seven number, that's the millennium. There's 7,000 years. And it's taken from the scripture when it says, the day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So there's certain indications in the scripture that is, we travel through this, and we are living in the sixth day. And what's the next millennium? This is the 6,000 year to the 7,000, the beginning of the 7,000 year. And the 7,000 is marking the millennial reign of Christ. <clears throat> Does everybody know the scripture? He will rule and reign a 1,000 years. And after that, the devil will be loose for a little season. So we have all different ways to measure time. We can measure in the orbit about the sun, but we can also measure where we are in space and time around the solar system. In the center of the solar system, they believe, is a black hole uh, around which our solar, our solar system, our system around our sun also is moving. So here's where I want to get your mind to go. And you're, what, what, you know, why are you doing all this? Because I'm wanting your mind to go somewhere else. I want you to get out of religious stuff for a minute and get into the creation of God and how we look at things, and then I want to talk about how God look at, looks at things. The one thing you have to have in measuring time is a constant. A constant. You, you, it has to be still. It has to be steady. It has to be always something, right? So even though it appears to us that our sun is steady, that our earth is steady, there are actually variations in the earth and how it moves and, and how things happen. And if it comes in contact with some other greater thing of gravity, it's going to affect Things just like the ocean waves are affected by the moon, the gravitational pull of the moon. So there's all kinds of things regarding gravity and space and all that that even can cause little jiggles and things with time. And so therefore, all clocks are not right. So then they went to the atomic clock because they could take an atom, and I'm not going to go into which atoms, but they'll take an atom and they see that the, the pulses of that atom and how it behaves is constant. But it's not really constant. They're still just a little bit off. Everything's just a little bit off because the constant is not really constant. It's mostly constant, but it's not totally constant. But guess what the one constant thing is outside? He said, I never change. I never change. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never change. Why? Because God and his word are one. So once, what is the constant, the constant of our universe? And I'm talking about, yes, space. I'm talking about the stars. I'm talking about all that's out there. But no, I'm also talking about the spiritual universe on the inside of us and the spiritual universe in general. What is the constant that is always constant? And it's God. So, God and his word are one. And you can always count on God and his word. It never moves. It never changes. There's, what did James say? There's neither variableness. Y'all missed a good place to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's neither variableness nor shadow of turning. Mm -hmm. 
There is no variation with God. He is the constant that never changes. In this entire universe, in the movements about it, in the planets and the stars and the nebula and all of that, there's no real constant. There's almost constant, but not real constant. But the one constant that always is, is God and his word. And what do we say about God and his word? It is eternal. So let's flip back for a moment to time. How do we look at time? Are we going to look at time through God's eyes and have his perception of time? Or are we going to look at it through our immediate solar system? Are we going to look at it through the clock on the wall? Are we going to look at it on the calendars that we have? Are we going to look at it as the sun coming up and the sun going down? Are we going to step outside of time and look at it from God's perspective? Hmm? I know, I've got to give you a minute just to, to, to grasp this because, see, I've been meditating on this for quite a while, and there's a whole lot to this. But God is the constant, and God's word is eternal. Now, in God's timetable... There is, obviously, he observes our time. And what does the Bible say? It says God set the planets, the stars. He calls it uh, oftentimes the, the host of heaven, the, the planets, the stars, the nebula. Everything is set there to do what? Mark the times and the seasons. Now, this is where we get into talking about there are astrologers that mark this as their constant. The times and the seasons based on the planets and the stars. Now, everybody goes, ooh, no, not astrology. Well, let me. there's something to astrology. Now, when I'm talking about that is I'm talking about the stars and the suns and the planet. There are effects of those things, but if you try to take all of this apart from the constant of the universe, then you're out there where time is not exactly right. Because there's no constant. Because the times and the seasons that are based on the stars and the planets and even comets the star that appeared when Jesus was born. When you're going to base your time just on this, they're all a little variable and wobbly. But when you base it on the fact that God put it there to mark times and seasons, then you're basing it on what God has placed there. But overriding this whole thing is the creator. I hope I don't run out of paper here. Who created all of these things. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. The creator who created all of these things. And he has determined time. Let's talk about that first. He has one to determine time. What is determined time? Okay, let's take a minute and read a scripture. Let's take a break and read a scripture here. All right, let's go to Second Peter chapter 3. Take a little break while that's settling into your brain. Second Peter chapter three. Let's jump out at verse nine first. It says, The Lord is not 
The Lord's not slow. <laughs> the Lord is not slow. Does that mean he's fast? No, it means you can't say he's on time. Yeah. He's on determined time. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. So there's been prophecies that have been given in the scriptures and hundreds of years go by before they're fulfilled. There's been prophecies given to people, personal prophecies. The Lord's spoken to some people and years have gone by and it hasn't been fulfilled. But Peter says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So the reason that it often appears that God is slow and God's not fulfilling a timetable is because he's waiting on us. get that sometimes because God is waiting on us we often picture the timing of God as if it's one two three four and if you miss it if you miss it then you missed it the end no it says God is not slow but he's patient and his loving kindness waiting on us let me give you an example here I think I've got it in my quick notes here All right, there's a scripture, and you can write this down, look it up later if you want to. In Genesis chapter 15, I'll write it down here. Genesis 15, 16. And it talks about Matter of fact, I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and go there. <laughs> Genesis 6, 16, 15. Did I say 15? Okay. All right. Okay, we can cover several things here. This is when God has appeared to Abraham. And God cut the covenant with Abraham. And in verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years years that was specific wasn't it and that was earth time wasn't it earth time so here we have 400 years and when God says your, your gener the generation will be that you bring forth on the earth will be held as slaves for 400 years, then he means 400 years. That means from the time that slavery stop starts until the time slavery ends will be 400 years. Is anybody, is there any way to misunderstand that? Nope. <laughs> Once they go in, 400 years they'll be slaves. And yet, in Exodus 12, 40 through 41, it says they were in Egypt 430 years. So which one's right? They both are. But here's where it comes to interpreting what God says from his point of time and understanding him is that they were in slavery 400 years, but they were in Egypt 
430. So there was 30 years in Egypt that they weren't slaves. Right? This got one plus one equals two, two plus two <laughs> equals four, two minus one equals one. Yeah. So were they slaves when they first went there? No. But I had a thought about it as I was thinking about this this whole thing. I thought, well, in reality, was there any space before or after that in the realm of the spirit, in God's eyes, they were no longer slaves? Think about it a minute. We're in the year... 2023, in the eyes of God, are we sick? In the eyes of God, are we poor and poverty stricken? In the eyes of God, are we failures? No. In the eyes of God, we are set free because of what Jesus did. In the eyes of God, if you if you really take it into consideration, what he has said in his word, in the eyes of God, and this is part of what I taught last week, and in the eyes of God, we've already moved over here. In the seventh millennium, in the millennial reign of Christ, where there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no crying, there's no weeping, there's peace. Now, in our eyes, we may not think we're there, but in the eyes of God, it's all accomplished. In the eyes of God, from outside of time, this is relative only to us, not to... Mm -hmm. this, in his eyes, this is done. He sees the end from the beginning, from outside of time. He's looking. He's, it's already happened. We've already won. The devil's defeated. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. From outside of time. From where we are somewhere in the very end of this 6,000 year period, it may not look that way, but it will if we look with the eyes of the spirit. Amen. If we get our eyes off of this time and on to this time. And this is where the healing power of God is. This is where we're coming into this revival and this great thing happening and the healing power of God because we tap into the millennial powers, the powers of the world to come. Anybody ever heard that? The powers of the world to come. This is, this is it. This is it. Okay, let's finish up. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Genesis 15. He says, but I, verse 14, I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So what happened when God sent his chosen servant Moses to talk to Pharaoh and to perform signs and wonders in front of him what happened? God said, you'll find as you go through this, the Lord sets a time. This time tomorrow, I will do this. Has anybody ever noticed that? I had. And I don't know what I thought because it was really weird. It's like all those frogs and stuff. And Moses said, you know, God says, if you'll obey me and let these people go, then I'll get all these frogs out of there. Do you want to do it or not? He said, well, maybe tomorrow. I want to deal with these frogs a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever wondered, why didn't God just give Pharaoh one chance and say, this is it. This is what's going to happen. This is, what, this is it. Okay, you're done. I mean, he told the people in Nineveh, you're going to all be judged. I mean, why? Why? Why the thing with Pharaoh? Because each time you see in the Bible when it talks about, I gotta have another page. I don't know. 
think I'm going to have to write a 300-page book on this one. But when you see, let's talk about one of the times of God is called tomorrow. When you see that tomorrow, that's God's mercy. When you see tomorrow, it's God's mercy. Why did God keep keep up with Pharaoh? And he said, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Why didn't God just say in the next five minutes, I'm going to strike you all down dead and repent? But God said, tomorrow. Why? Because if God is not slow. What did Peter say? God is not slow, but he's merciful. And so the extension of time, tomorrow. Tomorrow this is going to happen. Why? Because it's given you 24 hours to repent. In our own lives, there are times when God will deal with us personally about things and talk to us about it. You know, you need to get this straightened out. You need to forgive that person. You need to make this right. You need to do this. You need to do that. Oh, man, I just feel on the inside of me, you know, and I don't want to listen to that. And I don't want to listen to that. And I don't want to listen to that. But God keeps extending it and extending it and extending it. But there comes a time. <clears throat> there comes a time when it's not that God won't forgive you. It's not that God won't doesn't love you. But there comes a time by keeping putting off the voice of the Spirit that you become seared in your conscience. You become hardened in your heart like Pharaoh became hardened in his heart. And you're no longer capable of repenting. And I don't think I'm addressing anybody directly here. Maybe I am. But God always gives tomorrows. But then there comes a place. So, as I started out a while ago, Genesis 15, yes, 16. Let's start. We didn't read 15. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. Who are we talking about? Abraham. Abram at that point. You shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. Man, if God came to you and said, you'll go to your fathers in peace and you will live to a good old age, you wouldn't have any worries, would you? Threaten me, kill, threaten to kill me. Go ahead, man. The bullets will just pass through because God told me I'll live to an old age. Well, didn't he already say that in his word? Didn't he already say that in his word? Yeah, but God appeared to Abram. And what did Paul say? He said they lived under the... The, 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 those in Exodus lived under the cloud. They saw the miracles and they refused to believe and they were in unbelief. Are we in unbelief? Because God has told us. God has told us, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. Amen. How'd they get off on that? Okay. Back to Genesis fifteen sixteen, And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What does that mean? That is a <clears throat> variable time. Variable time. Remember when God himself sent a prophet to Hezekiah and said, get your house in order, you're going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and repented. And he said, God, I've done my best to serve you. I've made mistakes. He repented. He prayed to God and asked for, fifth, for more time, and God gave him 15 years. So did God change his mind? No, the prophet was right. He was going to die. But there was a variable there in that there was repentance and the heart changed. Mm -hmm. Was Jonah a false prophet? He prophesied God was going to destroy Nineveh. 
and God didn't. But why didn't God destroy Nineveh? Because they repented. The variable of repentance, the variable time, and we're living right now, and it seems like Jesus should have already come because things are so bad. But God's not yeah. slow. That's right. God's not slow. There is a determined time. And I showed you on the previous page that determined time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're at the very end of that. But I like this. This is what Dad says in his book, In Time Events. Determined time is like a football game. It is an hour, four 15-minute segments of play. Am I right about that? Has anybody ever watched a football game that lasted one hour? <laughs> no. Why? Because we've got to pause, stop and measure, pause, time out for the team to discuss. Pause because there are penalties. Pause because now we've got to take a look, rerun that back, and make sure that's what we saw. There's all these pauses. So, but there's always a starting up again until the completion, the final time, the last, the last minute, the last second. And how many of you know? In the last two seconds of a game, it can be won or lost. I've watched some of them. It's like, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, and then something happens, and there's a penalty, and there's a this or a that, and there's a field goal, there's a run, there's a mistake, there's a somebody turns around and runs 95 yards back. I mean, there's like... Things can happen in the last two seconds that change the outcome. And we're not talking about changing the outcome for the seventh millennium, for the millennial, for the end of this age, but we're talking about the final seconds for people to say, I see it now, I accept Jesus. Amen. I see it now, I accept the promise of the Holy Spirit. I see it now. I'm endued with power from on high and the gates of hell shall not stand against me. I see it now. I have the right and the authority to drag people out from the clutches yes. of the devil, to drag people out from the gates of hell, to break the gates of hell open and work signs and wonders and miracles like Jesus did because he said we'd do the greater works. Amen. There is a determined set time but we when we're talking about the coming of the lord we don't hear anything about this many years it's all an allegory it's all in this days and and a three and a half days time time and a half time it's it's all of these things you don't have the exact year that's the reason we don't know exactly when jesus will return let's go back to second peter chapter three Get back on with him. He's talking about scoffers. He said, in the last days, scoffers will come. Verse 4, and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? Don't you know Jesus is, I mean, Peter here, is writing and he's coming from a Jewish perspective and the Jewish perspective did the same thing. Yeah, we've heard about the Messiah for hundreds of years and he hadn't come and he hadn't delivered us from the Romans and he hasn't done this and that. But there's two comings. There's actually more than two comings. There is the coming of the Messiah where he became flesh, but there is the second coming. There's a rapture of the church where we all go up to meet the Lord in the air, we who know the Lord, and then there is are other raptures, and I've got black stuff all over my fingers. There are, there are other raptures, and then there is when Jesus himself descends and his feet touch the Mount of Olives, and he comes and he rules and he reigns. There are multiple comings. So they say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing 
as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Does it remind you of the 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 virgins with the their, whose oil ran out? They went to sleep. They weren't on watch. I think it's high time we're on watch. Yeah. I think it's high time we're on watch. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. It says they willfully overlooked this because they know that there was a world before this world. There was a cosmos before this cosmos. And what am I talking about? Cosmos, world system. And we know that the scientists have discovered the dinosaurs and all kinds of evidence of previous worlds that existed here, at least one. We don't know how many. And if we stand by and say the earth itself is only 6,000 years old, we miss it. If we say the cosmos, this cosmos, this age, this period of time is 6,000 years, we are correct. But if we say the earth is only 6,000 years old, then we need to go back and study the word of God. And it is at the beginning of our book, Genesis chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then it said, and the earth became. The earth became, not the earth was. God didn't create a destroyed, vacant, void planet. The earth became tohu va bohu in the Hebrew. And that just means a mess a big mess. It became that way sometime after the original creation. And so it's my personal belief, and you believe whatever you want to. We're not going to fall out over it. Just study it and come up with your own conclusion if you like, but study it because the, the prophet himself said that <coughs> God did not create the, the earth, tohu va bohu, so if God didn't create it that way, how did it get that way? The previous cosmos or world system that was ruled by Satan or angels, we don't have the full scope of it. But my guess is Satan was above over the angels who fell, tempted them. They fell, and they were over this world, and it was destroyed. There was more than one flood. There was the flood of Noah, that's right, but this is not what Peter's talking about. It said the world that then was, was deluged with water. It says it perished. The earth that received the flood of Noah did not perish. We're still living on it. So, the entire cosmos, world system, perished. And that was at the end of a period. And then we start with our current era. Okay. Verse 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment. The day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And I'm going to close with this, but interestingly enough, the, the word for judgment is division or separation. Division or separation. Remember the, the parable of the tares and the wheat? Do you, you know, the, the, they came to the farmer and said, man, there's tares growing up with your wheat. You want us to go in and pull them out? He said, no. Lest you mess up the wheat, just wait till the end and they will show themselves and then we will divide and take the wheat for our food and we will burn the tares. Does anybody question we're going through a separation right now? Judgment's already happening. And what I mean by judgment, everybody thinks judgment's when God stands on the throne and go, you go to heaven, you go to hell. That's the, you know, concept. But the judgment and the division and dividing ourselves is happening right now. 
And when it's being divided, we're being divided. Why? Because of the word of God, because of the constant of the universe, because Jesus has come and given us his life so that we can be restored. And we either believe it or we don't. We believe it or we don't. Okay. Is everybody still here with me? Yes. All right. We've got times and seasons. We've got determined time. And then we've got extensions of time, variable time, pauses. We've got earth time. Maybe I should have taken these just one at a time so that we can really wrap our minds around that. But this gives you something to think about. How do you look at time? It's not just one way. Time for us to shift from our time and shift our consciousness to God's time. And know that we are investing in this generation. We are investing in this time period and this dispensation. And that we are privileged to be at the very end, going into the millennium. And so rather than always looking back or looking in the present, we need to look to the future. And by looking to the future, we are trans formed into the image of God and what we will be because we see him as he is.